Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for the ASPPH Presents webinar, 400 Years of Inequality, a Public Health Perspective to Eliminate Racial Disparities. We are pleased to have over 500 registrants to today's webinar. I am Monica Gonzalez-Statler, and I am the lead staff for the ASPPH Diversity and Inclusion Committee. First, let's review today's agenda. We will begin by reviewing our learning objectives for the webinar, followed by introductions and presentations. We will wrap up with a question and answer period after the presentations. At any time during the presentation, you may ask questions using the question box located on the right side of your screen. Just type in your questions and ASPPH staff will direct your questions to the appropriate presenter during the Q&A period. Moderating today's webinar is Dr. Diane Marie St. George. Dr. St. George is Associate Professor and the MPH Program Director at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. St. George is also the Chair of the ASPPH Diversity and Inclusion Committee. I will now hand the presentation over to Dr. St. George. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for starting us off, Ms. Gonzalez Stadler. Today, we have a wonderful session planned for you. We have three learning objectives that we intend for you to be able to accomplish by the end of today's session, starting with the ability to assess how historical federal government policies dating back to chattel slavery have produced inequality in the United States. Secondly, we expect that you will be able to describe the connection between the 13th Amendment and current practices and policies around mass incarceration. And thirdly, by the end of today's session, we intend for you to be able to describe how health is impacted by social factors such as discrimination and with a specific focus on policies and practices related to incarceration here in the US. We have two speakers who are renowned experts in the, these areas, starting with Dean and Professor of the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, Dr. Tom Leviste. Dr. Leviste is an expert in US health and social policy and in the role that race plays in health research. Dr. Leviste will be our first presenter this morning. I'm turning it over to you, Dr. Leviste. Thank you very much. In, in August 16, 19, 20 Africans arrived in Jamestown, Virginia. The American colonies did not have a system of lifetime slavery, so most likely the Africans were indentured servants, meaning that they could earn their freedom after working the tobacco fields for a period of time, typically four to six years. Indentured servitude was common at the time. It was the process by which many whites traveled from Europe to the colonies. In 1639, Sir Francis Wyatt was appointed governor of the Virginia colony. Dr. Leviste, I believe you're, you've muted yourself. If you could please unmute yourself. Under Governor Wyatt's leadership, Virginia colony grew rapidly. He established the first written constitution and was the architect of the earliest judicial system, the governor's, um, governor's council. As governor, um, Sir, Wyatt, Sir Francis Wyatt's responsibilities was to preside over the council. Two years into Wyatt's second term, the council adjudicated a case that had monumental consequences. The council minutes recorded as a rather mundane case, but the court's decision on July 9th, 1640, turned out to have lasting implications for the nation. Hugh Gwynn, a planter in, Virginia, in the Virginia colony, petitioned the council, stating that three of his indentured servants had run away to Maryland. The minutes of the council's proceedings listed the runaway indentured servants as John Punch, described as a Negro, James Gregory, who was described as a Scotsman, and Victor, described as a Dutchman. Victor's surname was not recorded. All three indentured servants were captured and returned to Virginia, where on July 9, 1640, they stood trial before the council. The council ordered 30 lashings for all three men. Additionally, the white servants were sentenced to four additional years of servitude. 
For Mr. Punch, the sole black indentured servant was condemned to servitude, to servitude, uh, uh, service as for his master and his, his assigns for the time of his natural life here and elsewhere. This was the first legal precedent to establish lifelong servitude. The rulings of Wyatt's court in the John Punch case opened a new avenue for con uh, congressional lawmaking bodies to establish the labor pool that was greatly needed by the colonists. After Massachusetts became the first colony to formally legalize slavery, most of the other colonies followed. These slave laws codified slavery into law and would stand for more than two centuries until they were dismantled by an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. However, their constitutional amendment did not come until after a devastating civil war that claimed the lives of over 600,000 Americans. In, in 1662, a Virginia law established that uh, child status was determined by the mothers. Therefore, biracial children of enslaved black women born in Virginia inherited the servitude status of their mother, establishing that one could be born a slave. In 1640, Virginia law uh, uh, defined all non-Christian servants brought to the colonies by shipping as slaves for life. Each servant, um, such servants were almost without exception African. Africans began to convert to Christianity, but the Christian loophole was closed by, uh, for, for Africans by colonies by the late 1600s. For instance, in 1674, New York declared that blacks who converted to Christianity after enslavement would not be free. The creation of a separate and unequal America, the creation of a separate and equal America based on race began with the development of race-based enslavement. But perhaps if it had ended with enslavement, we may have been spared the legacy of inequality that haunts the country today. But this was not what happened. Instead, numerous government actions ensured that Africans and African-Americans would not benefit in proportion to their contributions to the country. Today, we see inequalities in four major sectors of society, health, wealth, criminal justice, and education. The legacy of inequality is passed from one generation to the next, and why its legacy endures. The follow in the following slides, I will provide a brief history of government actions that were pivotal in the creation of the inequities in each of these areas, which leads to health disparities that we see today. In 1862, the Homestead Act, signed by President Abraham Lincoln, provided 160 acres of land for $1.25 per acre to any American citizen, provided that they agreed to live on and cultivate the land. While the Homestead Act was not explicitly race-based, African Americans were not eligible for citizenship in 1862, and as such, were not eligible to participate in this massive transfer of assets from the federal government into the hands of private owners. In June 1865, the Civil War ended, and the, and the uh, 13th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified six months later, bringing, uh, bringing slavery to a formal end. A period of redress and, reconsiderate and reconstruction ensued, but the 13th Amendment included a carve-out that allowed for involuntary servitude for persons who were incarcerated. This would prove to be this would prove to be key in maintaining. I'm sorry, it's not, all right. This would prove to be key in maintaining racial inequality, as I will discuss later. With the passage of the 14th Amendment. African Americans became eligible to participate in homesteading. However, while, this, uh, while their interest in acquiring land was high, only a small number who applied succeeded. Under President Andrew Johnson's equivocal support of the Freedmen's Bureau and the many challenges from Southern states to the Bureau's dictates, the efforts of African Americans to ex exercise their rights of citizenship were often thwarted. Even African Americans who fought as Union soldiers in the Civil War 
of those who were serving as buffalo soldiers were prevented from acquiring land. The demise of Reconstruction and the failure of the Homestead Act to include a substantial number of African Americans are among the most significant missed opportunities in the nation's history. Homesteading held great potential for the provision of reparations for the former slaves. However, Reconstruction only lasted a dozen years, hardly enough time to make up for more than 200 years of oppression. During the Depression era, um, Congress created the Homeowners Loan, Homeowners Loan Corporation in an attempt to slow down the number of home foreclosures. The HOLC refinanced mortgage and established new low interest self amateurizing mortgages to over 1 million homeowners who had de defaulted on or already lost their homes. In, th eight, in 1934, the FHA underwriting handbook included residential security maps, which in contained a color coding system indicating where mortgages could and could not be insured. The maps were developed by the HOLC and covered 239 American cities. The maps included lines and shaded areas, which included neighborhoods within the city. The shading system used four colors, green, blue, yellow, and red, and it made a big difference which color a community received. Green communities were uh, referred to as type A. These communities were considered to be the most desirable areas with the nearly with nearly all white residents. Communities that were shaded in blue were called type B. These communities were still desirable areas that had reached their peak in terms of development, but were expected to remain stable over time. Communities shaded in yellow were called type C. These included communities that the HOLC regarded as definitely declining neighborhoods that were generally characterized by older properties. Finally, communities lined in red were type D. These neighborhoods were communities where uh, mortgages could not be written. The legal practice of redlining, the legal practice of redlining ended with the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968. However, housing discrimination continues Numerous studies show that even when equal, equally qualified white mortgage borrowers and African Americans, African Americans still have a harder time acquiring mortgages. When they do acquire a mortgage, they often pay higher fees, and these situations are even more dire if seeking a mortgage in a predominantly black neighborhood. The racial wealth gap was even exacerbated by the liberal social programs of the President Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration. The 1935 Civil Rights Act helped to create a safety net for American families, specifically for aging, disabled, unemployed, and, un un and underemployed Americans. The Social Security program is widely credited for lifting millions of Americans out of poverty. However, agricultural laborers and domestic workers were excluded from the program. So while many white Americans were able to use Social Security to help support their families, many African Americans and other minorities were not afforded this opportunity. Another opportunity to address the racial wealth gap missed by government policy was the Servicemen's Readjustment Act or the GI Bill of, 19, of 1944. The GI Bill was designed to help the nation's World War II servicemen to reabsorb into the US economy. The GI Bill provided veterans with low interest mortgages and funds to cover tuition at colleges and trade schools. A study conducted by economists Sarah Tur uh, Turner and John Bowne found that white men and some African American men in the Northern states were able to take advantage of the GI Bill educational benefits. For them, the GI Bill was one of the biggest drivers of the development of a middle class in the second half of the 20th century. However, the story was more complicated in the Southern states where most African-Americans live. In the, Southern, in the South, black veterans faced rampant discrimination, which narrowed their options and limited their use of educational benefits that, had earned, uh, that they'd earned through their military service. Educational disparities. The federal government's role in fostering racial inequalities post-slavery extends beyond the Homestead Act. 
The Morrill Act of 1862 granted up to 30,000 acres of federal lands for states to establish universities for agriculture and technical education. However, in many cases, the universities did not admit African Americans. But rather than using its considerable leverage to re require colleges to admit and educate African Americans, Congress passed a second Morrill Act in 1890, establishing 19 public colleges and universities for Blacks. By doing so, Congress created a racially segregated system of public higher education that endures until today. In 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson decision, the US Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of separate but equal institutions for blacks and whites. The court's decision became law despite the obvious fact that nearly all public facilities for African Americans were vastly inferior in quality compared to public facilities for whites. The separate but equal doctrine would remain the law of the land until 1954 when the Supreme Court overturned Plessy v. Ferguson in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education. In spite of the progress that resulted from that Brown versus the Board, of, uh, Board case over the decades, as the Supreme Court's role in enforcing integration waned, there was a dramatic resegregation of schools throughout the nation that persists until today. Policies creating racial uh, criminal justice disparities. The framework for overtly race-based law and policy that started with Wyatt's decision endured more than 300 years. It was used to establish and maintain Jim Crow era of racial inequalities that were, uh, that were common until passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which outlawed race-based policies. With the passage of the law, a new form of discrimination would begin one that was equally devastating for African-Americans. In July of 1969, President Richard Nixon delivered a special message to Congress where he identified drug abuse as a serious national threat and declared a war on drugs. Nixon declared that war on drugs. When Nixon declared the war on drugs, there were fewer than 200,000 persons in custody in American federal and state prisons. By 2009, when the Obama administration declared the end to the war on drugs, there were 1.5 million persons in prison. One year after Nixon's call for a new focus on anti-drug policies, Congress responded uh, to the president's call by passing the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970. In addition to consolidating previous drug laws, it allowed drug enforcement officials to conduct no-knock searches and created a drug classification schedule system that designated some drugs such as marijuana, heroin, and LSD as Schedule I drugs, meaning they were unsafe for recreational or medical use. According to the U U.S. Department of, the, of Justice, in 1969, when Richard Nixon was elected president, there were 196,007 prisoners in custody in US federal, state, and correctional facilities. By 1981, when President Reagan was inaugurated, that number had increased to 359,167, an increase of 80%. Passage of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 toughened penalties for use, possession, and sale of crack cocaine. This was the first law to establish mandatory minimum sentences for crack cocaine. It mandated a 100 to 1 ratio where one gram of crack would lead to an equivalent sentence to 100 grams of powder cocaine. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, an amendment to the 1986 Act, established a five-year minimum uh, mandatory minimum for it and a 20 year min, uh, minimum sentence for even a simple possession of at least five grams of crack cocaine and penalties for possession or sale within 100 feet of a school. It also established a one year maximum penalty for possession of any amount of illegal drug, including powder cocaine. Predictably, these measures exacerbated mass incarceration. So in 1980, when President Reagan was inaugurated, there were three, 358,000 prisoners in custody in American federal and state correctional facilities. By the end of Reagan's presidency in 1989, 
the number of prisoners in custody had increased to 710,000, a 101 percent increase. President Bill Clinton was elected in 1993 as a centrist Democrat with a reputation for being tough on crime. The year after his election, President Clinton signed into law the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994, also known as the Crime Bill. The Crime Bill expanded the death penalty, encouraged states to lengthen prison sentences, eliminated federal funds for inmate education, and created a federal habitual offender law. The habitual offender provision included the three strikes policy, which significantly increased prison sentences for everyone who had been convicted of three or more felonies. In 1993, when President Clinton took office, there were 970,000 prisoners in the federal and state prisons. By 2001, when he left office, that number had increased to 1.4 million, a 45% increase. And in 1990, the Obama administration sought to signal an end to the war on drugs. Obama, Obama signed the, uh, the Fair Sentencing Act and initiated the Clemency Initiative. The Fair Sentencing Act of, 20, of uh, 2010 partially addressed the disparity in sentencing between crack and powder cocaine. In 19, uh, 2014, the Obama administration's clemency initiative encouraged qualified federal inmates to petition to have their sentences commuted or reduced by the president. When President Obama took office in 2009, there were 1.6 million prisoners. By 2015, there, were about, there was about a 5% decrease to 1.5. America's 40-year war on drugs has been devastating for African-American communities. As the chart shows, each successive policy ratcheted up the intensity and increased the number of Americans who are in prison, while mass incarceration which has touched nearly every racial group. No group has been as dramatically affected by African-Americans. The line connecting slavery to mass incarceration goes through a long history of race-based policies that were designed to disadvantage African-Americans. When opportunities to set things right presented, the country has consistently taken the wrong path. These policies and the cultural norms that support them are the underlying reasons why the negative social determinants that affect African-Americans result in the health inequalities that we see today. Thank you, Dr. Laviste. Thank you very much for your inspiring words. Um, right now, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Robert Fullerlove. Dr. Fullerlove is the Associate Dean of Community and Minority Affairs and Professor of Clinical Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. Fullerlove is a lead visionary behind the 400 Years Movement at Columbia. Together with Dr. Mindy Fullerlove, and Dr. Laviste, Dr. Fullerlove has co-authored an article, an editorial in the January 2019 edition of the American Journal of Public Health entitled 400 Years of Inequality Since Jamestown of 1619. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Fullerlove. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Dean Laviste. Uh, really very much uh, in your debt for having led the way with the editorial that we put together to give us an opportunity to really plumb in much greater depth the ways in which the 13th Amendment and mass incarceration have had a specific impact on people of color and communities of color in the United States. If I can go to the next slide. I wanna remind everyone of this very important proviso within the 13th Amendment, which seems to, on the one hand, and slavery, but on the other hand, creates a rather important backdoor that was very significantly exploited by Southern states who faced at the end of the Civil War a sharp decline in their access to free labor. It became clear that while slavery ended as an improvement in the lives of African-Americans who had been living under the boot of slavery, 
the impact that this law, this amendment rather, had on the free labor market that was available to the South was rather severe. How do you go from an economic system that makes sufficient and intensive use of free labor to one where all of a sudden that labor has disappeared? The backdoor that's created by the 13th Amendment was quickly used by states in the South and by those who were slaveholding states to create something in the way of a set of laws that would result in discriminatory practices that would be levied against African-American populations. What we're looking at as an extension of the philosophy that made slavery so important in the construction of the United States remained as a system of social control and economic control that was hugely advanced by the courts, by the police, and by the criminal justice system. As fates passed laws that made things like loitering or being in a city without working papers a crime, it quickly became apparent that the slave labor had been replaced by convict labor. Next slide. This is the image that was created by that back door. Chain gangs became a reality. It became clear that with imprisoned populations, states could lease the labor that represented by the men pictured here to corporations and to private individuals to make sure that they had access to what was essentially free labor that essentially continued the impact of slavery well into the beginning of the 20th century. Next slide. It is a system that exists today. This is a modern gang chain gang from an image that was taken from the state of Alabama. It's important to understand that in Dean Levis's state, Louisiana, the penitentiary Angola, which exists on the land that was once a plantation, is a state system of incarceration that requires that almost 80% of the inmates, the persons who are incarcerated there, be compelled to work. They're compelled to work on chain gangs like this and have a great deal to do with maintaining the roads, the highways, and the fields that are part of that state. This access to free labor is one of the ways in which the inequalities that were created by the Constitution of the United States and the three uh, amendments, the, excuse me, the three sections that made slavery a permanent part of what the early Americas would look like continued to the 20th and the 21st century with the creation of chain gangs. Next slide. As Professor Leviste has pointed out, whatever might have been true in the South continues into the 21st century with Richard Nixon's declaration of a war on drugs. As you can see from this rather dramatic chart, the impact of the war on drugs and the degree to which this extended the social control that was created by that amendment, that back door in the 13th Amendment, continues into the 21st century. This is a slightly updated slide, which indicates that as of 2017, there were almost 1,500,000 individuals who were doing time in state and federal facilities in the United States. And if we can go to the next slide, it becomes evident that as you examine the characteristics of the prison population, the disparity that has such a dramatic impact on health disparities in the United States is well represented in the prison population. 38% of people in state or federal prisons were black. A significant portion were also Hispanic. It becomes clear that with one in every 13 black males aged 30 to 34 being in prison in 2011, the disparities, the inequities, and the problems that are created by having a large carceral population represent a tragedy that is still visited largely on communities of color, but most especially on the black community. Next slide. Although these statistics vary significantly by state, nationwide, 3% of all adults and 10% of African Americans are currently doing time in a state or federal facility. As noted in the slide, while rates vary significantly by state, it is clear that the overall impact nationally, as well as in terms of what we see in the 50 states of the United States, the overwhelming impact is still a system of social control that largely impacts 
not just folks of color, but most especially the African-American community. Next slide. This is a system that has visited inequalities on just about every American community. 8% of all adults in the US have a current or past felony conviction. It's important to understand that while the United States represents 5% of the world's population, as a nation, we imprison 25% of the world's prisoners. Put in other terms, 25% of all the folk doing time in prison anywhere in the world are doing time in prisons in the United States. Once again, as is demonstrated in this slide, the contrast for African Americans is sharp. 23% of all African American adults are living with the problems created by a felony conviction. If you shift and look specifically in how this has impacted males, 33% of all African American males are currently living with the consequences of a felony record. Next slide. As is uniquely detailed in the book, The New Jim Crow, what we're looking at isn't just the problem that is created when someone is locked behind bars. An incarcerated person upon release from prison enters a community where the problems created by that felony conviction continue to largely determine many of the options that are available to the individual once they have returned home. They have limited citizenship rights. In many states in the United States, in fact, in seven states of the United States, one out of every four African-American males has permanently lost the right to vote because he is living with a felony conviction. It comes as no surprise to the audience, I know, that if you are returning home with a felony conviction, your options for getting a job are severely hampered, severely limited. It becomes clear that with the passage of the 1994 Criminal Act by the Congress, which destroyed access to the Pell Grants for young men and women who were doing colleges behind bars, the limited educational training opportunities that ceased in 1994 persist when someone goes home. It is very difficult in many states to enter a college or a university if you have a felony conviction. And it becomes clear that one of the most important elements of mass incarceration has been the way in which that status for the individual coming home represents a stigma that is very difficult to avoid. Next slide. It's important to understand that there are almost 5 million people who have been released from prison. And as returning citizens, they discover that they've been returned to communities, many of which are suffering from all the problems that have been created by having such a significant number of their adult citizens doing time in prison. And the fact that so many of these inner city communities are welcoming these individuals back home puts a strain on almost all the social services that are available there, especially if Formerly incarcerated persons have difficulty gaining access to those services based on the simple fact that they have a felony conviction on their record. The, act, the fact that 68% uh, of all persons under correctional supervision are now being supervised at home means that a substantial burden has been placed on the communities where these individuals are currently housed. Next slide. The overall impact is really quite astounding. 19.8 million people in the US have a felony conviction. It is estimated that 100 million US residents are estimated to have had a criminal record, either because of their interactions with the courts, the police, in a variety of different ways. But this really has haunted much of American society so that its impact on communities of color, while extreme, is an impact that is also being felt throughout the United States in all communities. Next slide. Efforts to explain the impact that mass incarceration has had have also demanded for many individuals that there'd be an explanation for why there are such high rates of arrest that result in so many people being thrown into prison. Bruce Weston and colleagues have argued that the high rates in poor communities explain high rates are explained by high rates of police surveillance. Everything about modern criminal management on the part of the police means that we are often sending police into hotspots. And those hotspots are places where crime 
is thought to be present. And the presence of such a significant portion of the police force there increases the odds that an individual living in that community will have contact with the police, a contact which may ultimately result in their being arrested and their being sent to trial. And as a result of the trial, being sent to serve time in a prison facility. It's important to understand that the large residual racial dis disparity in imprisonment appears to be due to differential treatment on the part of African Americans and in many and many Hispanics in their communities as a result of the actions of the police as well as the courts. Next slide. My colleagues Miller and Alexander have really argued that what we're looking at is a new social arrangement that's been created by the degree to which we're using the courts, the prisons, and the police as methods of social control. They have essentially created what is described by my colleagues as carceral citizenship, a novel social arrangement produced by crime control, born in the era of mass incarceration and its community analog, mass supervision in the form of parole, in the form of probation, in the form of various forms of supervision by the courts. Next slide. I want to argue that what we're looking at is something that has a dramatic impact on communities. It's not just what we can observe on the part of individuals who have been incarcerated. It becomes clear that their loss to the community creates, as is indicated by my colleagues Abramowitz and Albrecht, a sense of community loss that becomes really important because it has impacts that go beyond the individual who's incarcerated to include family as well as neighbors. The loss to communities is significant. Next slide. In my own work as someone dealing extensively with the impact of HIV in communities of color in the United States, here in New York, we have really seen how the war on drugs produced one of the most important phenomena with respect to HIV, the imprisonment of large numbers of individuals who are locked up as a result of their engagement in drug sales, drug possession, and drug use at a moment when individuals who were involved in the sharing of needles probably represented the most important risk factor, the most important risk group for HIV infection in the United States. The fact that so many of these folks were locked up and the fact that 25% of all the persons living with HIV in prison in the United States were in prisons in New York really helps us understand how this was fundamentally a community phenomenon. Seven neighborhoods in New York State that provided 74% of the prison population in the 1990s were the seven neighborhoods that had the highest rates of HIV in the nation. This sort of suggests that the circulation between the prison on the one hand and the community on the other had a great deal to do with driving the HIV epidemic in the black community, but most especially here in New York, which has been an epicenter of the HIV epidemic almost since the epidemic's inception. Next slide. Here's one of the ways of understanding how this impact has been visited upon communities. This is from the Justice Mapping Center that indicates that if you were to look at the blocks in the city of New York, where residents of each block who are incarcerated can be multiplied times $60,000 a year, the cost that is associated with keeping someone locked up in this state, what you will create is a block where more than $1 million is being spent, not on education, not on health, not on the general so social welfare of the community. No, it's being spent to lock people behind bars. And in many respects, that loss of income is not just a function of the losses economically that are incurred because of the loss of individuals, it also represents a significant vacuum that's been created in the social life of these communities, which I want to suggest has a huge impact on health inequalities. Next slide. If you were to go back and forth between a vision of the million dollar blocks on the one hand and health disparities in New York, as is represented by this 2004 report from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Health Disparities in New York, you start to see that the dark areas, which represent the most significant impact of HIV AIDS or deaths due to diabetes, that we are basically looking at the same neighborhoods that have also suffered very high rates of incarceration. 
the relationship spatially between health disparities on the one hand and mass incarceration on the other is really beautifully represented by the notion of the million dollar block, which represents not simply a loss of income, not simply a loss of citizens, but also a loss in the capacity of those who remain to maintain good health and have access to health care. Next slide. I uh, give this talk a lot. I'm very given to describing in as brutal terms as possible the impact that mass incarceration has had on communities. But the problem with a presentation like this is that it seems to present members of African American and Hispanic communities as victims. And I think it becomes important to understand that there has to be, for those of us in public health, something that gives us a sense of agency something that allows folk who are caught up in the madness of mass incarceration, an opportunity to do something that will allow them to dramatically impact their status as well as their status in the community. Next slide. I have been teaching for 10 years in the Bard College Prison Initiative. If it's okay for me to give a plug on November 25th, PBS will basically be broadcasting College Behind Bars, which is a beautiful documentary that describes the impact of the Bard Prison Initiative on the persons who are incarcerated who have had the good fortune to be given college education possibilities while they're on the inside. The initiative was established in 1999 by Bard College. Their work in the prison offers an AA degree and a BA degree that is fully representative of the kinds of classwork that students at Bard College itself have access to, and the impact that this program has had on inmates, on persons who are incarcerated, who are attempting to find access to educational opportunities has been dramatic. As is noted in the slide, almost 500 students have uh, benefited from access to these programs. And it becomes clear that with almost 550 degrees having been awarded to incarcerated persons as a result of their participation in the Bard Prison Initiative, you're beginning to see a dramatic impact on the ways in which education on the inside provides the kind of agency that has dramatic results on many of the statistics that we associate with mass incarceration. Next slide. I've been teaching as part of a public health initiative that offers opportunities for students in the six institutions that are part of the Bard Prison Initiative to have exposure to and access to coursework as well as lectures that focus on public health. Our objective is simple. We want folk when they come home to understand that public health is very often a felony friendly opportunity for work that not only provides folk with employment, it gives them an opportunity to have a dramatic impact on the health disparities that many of them study as part of their exposure to public health and its impact on the community. The idea that these are folk who know full well the nature of the community problems, the degree to which they understand that they have perhaps been contributors to the problem, and the idea that they are in a position perhaps to do something about it as public health workers has meant that this has been one of the most popular concentrations in the Bard Prison Initiative estimates for all the work that they're doing in the prisons. Next slide. We tried to have the state of New York understand the importance of promoting programs like this on the inside, literally because in lieu of spending $60,000 on a group of uh, folk who are gonna be locked up and who have a 40 to 45% chance, 45 chance of returning after five years, the recidivism rates that are associated with the Bard Prison Initiative are astounding. Fewer than 4% of those who have graduated, 4% of those who have uh, the ability to claim that they are alums of the Bard Prison Initiative, fewer than 4% of them have returned to a status of being incarcerated. One would think that with the impact that this can have, on the state spending for imprisonment. It costs roughly $5,000 to provide an education like this versus $60,000 to keep someone locked up, that the state would rapidly embrace the notion that this is an idea whose time has come. The difficulty, however, is that the stigma that is associated with being incarcerated has meant that many members of the state legislature see this as an opportunity 
to have folk who committed crimes get access to an education for free. And in representing their constituents, they say, how can we let a system like this, which is unjust, unjust for those who are struggling to put kids in college, how can we have a system like this persist? The argument that economically speaking, this is an idea that has a dramatic impact on the state's budget, the state spending on incarceration, is still for the moment an argument that falls on deaf ears. Next slide. However, it's under understandable for someone like me, however, that when I talk to my students on the inside, when I talk to persons who are struggling with issues of incarceration, and give them a sense that there are possibilities in public health that will allow them to have a dramatic impact on the health of the communities to which they'll return. I often point to the example of Richard Gamara, a kid who in high school was incarcerated for the first time as a result of a conviction for gun possession. This is someone who after 12 years of incarceration completed the B, the, excuse me, the AA degree on the inside, and then went on to complete a BA degree in CUNY and a master's in public health from the Mailman School of Public Health. Next slide. In 2017, Rich got a master's degree. He and three other members of the Bard Prison Initiative who have completed degree work are currently working for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Next slide. Of all the things that I can imagine as a result of our efforts to focus on the history of mass incarceration, the manner in which this is part of a legacy that began with slavery, at a moment we're trying to imagine what will the future be bring? What are the ways in which we can create a sense of agency on the folk who have suffered so dramatically from mass incarceration? The idea that education on the inside has the capacity to change the lives of so many others. The idea that there are an enormous number of individuals currently doing time who have the capacity, the talent, the intellect, and the brilliance to really dramatically impact many of the programs that we, and many of the problems, excuse me, that we in public health confront, has meant for me that there is something powerful about the Bard Prison Initiative and something that I think really requires that for those of us in public health, we engage in redoubled efforts to make sure that the opportunities that are represented in a program like this are available in every state where the need to combat health disparities is extreme and when the possibility of getting a workforce trained to do the work that many of us struggle to do in these communities is once again an idea whose time has come. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fuller Love. Um, we started off with some gruesome details <laughs> um, and ended on a high note with uh, call to action. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to the question and answer period. Hopefully people have been thinking of their questions and putting them in the chat box. Um, and let's go through those one by one, please. Great, thank you, Dr. St. George. So first, um, we have a question for uh, Dean Levice. It is, the review of federal laws and impact on African Americans was informative and shocking. As a student, what role can we, the students, have to focus on changing federal policies and laws to focus on correcting inequalities? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for that question. I, I think it's important first that we understand the genesis of laws. Many of the laws that we live under today have um, an, an underlying intent that uh, may not be consistent with what is seeming to be the objective of the law. And we need to educate ourselves about what those laws are. And the other aspect of the law of laws that we need to consider from a policy standpoint is that there's always the potential for the unintended consequence. So most of the laws that I discussed had an intentional, there was an intent to produce a racially disparate outcome. Some laws don't necessarily have that intent, but still produce that racially disparate outcome. So I think what we what I would suggest students do is learn about policy analysis and learn to think critically about policies and how policies are created because ultimately policies through policy we can recreate reality we basically change the rules of society and 
and in changing those rules, we change the way that people live. And so policy is powerful and policy has the opportunity to free, but it also has the possibility to put people in bondage. Thank you, Dean Levist. Um, we now have um, a question. Are there resources, and this is um, for, uh, for both of you to answer, as well as um, Dr. St. George, if you know, um, are there resources available for those of us who want to teach about these issues in public health courses at our own universities? Well, I think uh, one of the really important developments in the nation's focus on the problems created by mass incarceration is the fact that there are an enormous number of websites that provide not just updates on data examining what's the impact that these policies are having at a state as well as a federal level. There are also large numbers of websites that are really engaged in helping people understand what are the policy issues that can be undertaken at the federal level as well as the local level. If it's okay to give a plug, the sentencingproject.org is one place that provided me with many of the numbers that I've provided here. And then there's the uh, Equal Justice Institute, which I think is probably doing absolutely incredible work to help folk figure out how to navigate the issues of mass incarceration, both at the local as well as the state and federal level. I think these sites often provide information. They give us data about trends. They alert us to all of the issues that we know are focused heavily on policies and the ways in which those policies as they are changing can have a positive or a negative effect. And I think it's really important for those of us who are in states that now have access on a provisional basis to producing Pell Grants for use by persons who are incarcerated who are looking for a college education. The simple fact that many state colleges now have an opportunity to perhaps reproduce the Bard Prison Initiative means for me that whether you're a student, whether you're a faculty member or a public health professional, there are opportunities to use the workforce that is locked up behind bars to really do something significant about, as I suggested in my talk, the health disparities that we're also engaged in trying to combat. Thank you. Uh, Dean LaVista, Dr. St. George, do you have anything to add? Okay, we will um, go on. I'm sorry, is that Dr. St. George? No, we, no, we can go on. Okay. So there's a, um, a question that um, is addressed for, um, for both Dr. Um, Dr. Fulalove and Dean LaVista. It is, can you address disparities in access to health insurance and the importance of Medicare and Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act? Uh, can you say the first part of that question again? Address what? Sure, it's can you address disparities in access to health insurance? So address disparities in access to health insurance and the importance of Medicare, Medicaid, and the ACA. Yeah. So, well, I mean, there, I, mean I, I would respond to that, that question by talking about how, as part of the Affordable Care Act, there was a provision whereby the federal government would pay the lion's share of the expense for any state that would expand uh, Medicaid, um, Medicaid eligibility, to, to ex increase the number of people in the state who have access to the Medicaid program and therefore reduce uninsured, uh, the percentage of uninsured. And that many of the states that refuse to expand are states in the South that have the largest uh, black populations, but also the largest percentage of poor people who would have benefited from, um, from that expansion, and, but, are, but are also the states with the worst health status, right? And so by um, these um, mostly Republican governors refusing to expand, they refuse to you know, increase the, um, the uh, to provide that, that, that opportunity to, to, their, um, to their citizens. It's also interesting to point out that that expansion was being paid for with federal tax dollars. And of course, people who live in the South in those states that didn't expand 
do still pay federal income taxes so that basically uh, residents of those states were paying for the expansion that occurred in the states that tend to be richer states in the North and in the West that did expand. So not only were they not getting the benefit of the Affordable Care Act, the expansion of Medicaid, but they were also paying for the other states that actually did um, expand. So we've got, um, so there's a, there's a political issue there. One of the uh, other factors I would bring into this is that in this country, and I, do, I, I believe, at least in my personal experience, I'm, I could be wrong, that this country is unique in that this is the only country where the fact that we tie access to health care to employment is viewed as an acceptable condition. Nowhere else in the world do we organize health care in this way. And it seems um, counter to the best interests of this country, counter even to the economy, because how many people do you know who don't quit their jobs simply because they can't afford to give up access to health care, but may have great business ideas or opportunity or entrepreneurial ideas that actually could expand the economy. So it also runs uh, counter to the interests of, of economic, um, um, of the economy in this country. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Fulola, do you have anything to add? Well, only that uh, since I've focused a lot on populations that are heavily impacted by mass incarceration, it's really astounding to see the variation on a state by state basis and the degree to which having the status of being formally incarcerated impacts your ability to gain access to health care. Sometimes that health care is also tied to housing. And in many instances, access to federal housing that's provided uh, under Section 8 or as a result of access to federally constructed public housing uh, centers it becomes clear that if you are formally incarcerated, not only are you barred from gaining access to that kind of housing, it's also clear that your family can be barred if you try to gain access to the places where they live. To the degree that housing has a dramatic impact on health and on the ability of individuals to maintain their health, to the degree that housing also is one of the key issues gaining access to health care, it becomes clear that one of the issues that we want to continue to confront and that was at least a part of the original formulation of the Affordable Care Act, was to broaden the issue of access and to, in many cases in the Obama administration, limit the degree to which discrimination in housing based on the status of being formally incarcerated would cease. Whether or not those policies are gonna continue depends a lot, I think, on the policy advocacy that those of us in public health are able to put together. If it's our business to provide the opportunities for folks to gain access both to health care and to the resources that we know are dramatically implicated in health, then it becomes our job to look at all the ways in which everything from mass incarceration to changes and challenges to the Affordable Care Act will have an impact on the work we do and the quality of the health of the populations with which we work. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have time for one more quick question, and uh, I apologize to those who have um, shared questions, but we uh, don't have time to address all of them. Um, and this could be either uh, Dean Levista or Dr. Fulala. Are there any statistics or impacts on women of color in mass incarceration and community outcomes? Absolutely. Actually, here at the uh, Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, we have an art gallery in our building and where we um, where we have exhibits on socially engaged art and actually right now we have an exhibit called Per Sister which is an exhibit about mass incarceration among women and um, talking about their stories and the ways in which when women are incarcerated it's not only the woman but it's the entire family that's incarcerated that the children are impacted by it and in fact, the children can actually be put into foster care and even adopted away from them. They can lose their parental rights um, while they're in prison. And, and, uh, and in the exhibit, you know, it talks about the stories of these women and how, in many cases, relatively tri trivial or minor offenses would lead to extremely long prison terms. In prisons that were designed and pol with policies that were designed to incarcerate men, 
but don't account for the unique uh, or different needs that women may have. So the, the, the impact of mass incarceration on women has been underappreciated, underrecognized, and it's, it's a severe problem that we need to be uh, addressing as well. It needs to be addressed as a separate issue distinct from male incarceration, because there are different issues. I think once again, that some of the best statistics on the impact of mass incarceration on women can be found in sentencingproject.org. Uh, they have really understood that while 90% of the incarcerated populations in the U.S. are male, women represent an increasingly important part of that population, and their numbers are growing. So a lot of the issues about, as Professor Levis just pointed out, a lot of the issues having to do with the differential treatment according to males versus females, that becomes, once again, a major public health issue that many of us have to be concerned with, especially if we're concerned about the health of women who are returning to their community after a period of incarceration, because many of the issues that they face, especially integrating with their families, are extreme. And once again, there are a substantial number of websites to deal with this issue. My urging as a professor is that you go study them, because some of the data that you will find is quite illuminating. Yeah. I think it's also instructive just to, to say that 82% of women in, in prison are there either because of substance abuse or because of retaliation against uh, domestic violence. And in many cases, when, you, when they reta retaliate because of the, uh, domestic violence, their punishment is actually more severe than the punishment of the uh, original uh, person who had um, victimized them and that they were retaliating for. So these are complicated issues that we really don't address or discuss often enough, and we really need to look at them and create specific policies around the unique aspects of incarceration for women. Great, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm just gonna flip through a, a couple of additional slides for your information. Um, there are several uh, resources out there available toward the 400 years movement. Um, these are just a few of them, um, but um, as Dr. Fuller have noted, you know, please go out and do additional research on your own. This is um, a very important movement and um, topics that need and should be addressed. In addition, please mark your calendars for the upcoming ASPPH annual meeting in March 2020. Keynote speakers include Dr. Julio Frank, president of the University of Miami, and Sir Michael Marmot, Director of the University of Health Equity at University College of London. This webinar was recorded and will be available on the events page of the ASPPH website. Thank you again to today's speakers and to all of our attendees to today's webinar, Recognizing 400 Years of Inequality. This ends today's webinar. Thank you again and have a good day.